right? In I'm your normal speaking voice. I'm Justice Cynthia Aaron. I'm an Associate Justice on the 4th Appellate District Division 1 in San Diego. And spell your last name for me, please. It's A-A-R-O-N. Uh, Howard Weiner, W-I-E-N-E-R. And your title when you were on the bench? Uh, Associate Justice of the 4th uh, Appellate District, Division I, San Diego. Excellent. We're ready to start any time. All right. We're here today to interview Justice Howard Weiner, um, a retired justice from our court, the 4th Appellate District, Division I in San Diego, for the Appellate Court's Legacy Project Oral Histories. Um, I'm going to call you Howard, if that's all. That's okay. And, and again, let's uh, deviate from probably the protocol that uh, folks might want, because there are a couple of things I'd like to say uh, before we start. And I think the reason is, or as I, I think I know the reason is, that I'm concerned that if we get too immersed, I won't be able to express the appreciation and thanks uh, to those who I think are entitled to it. So I made a few notes. And uh, because I really do appreciate this opportunity and uh, really feel privileged uh, by having uh, the chance to be here and have uh, you, Cindy, uh, interview me. Uh, I, I want to make sure I thank uh, Chief Justice George uh, for this opportunity. And no question he should be complimented uh, for his leadership in reference to this, uh, the California Appellate Court's uh, legacy project. Uh, uh, I'm comfortable in saying that an oral history of former justices of the California's appellate courts, uh, I would hope would be of value to uh, individual jurists in the future, as well as legal historians and the public. And I would like to think that in some direct and indirect ways, it will improve the administration of justice. Uh, I also want to thank Justice Haller of this court, uh, who I've known for a long time. Uh, she's a very hard worker, wonderfully conscientious as the chair of the Legacy Project, as well as all the others on the committee. Uh, and, of course, my thanks to Justice Aaron, who has graciously agreed to interview me. And I know in this process I leave out uh, a lot of people, but, uh, you know, the uh, uh, people in the Judicial Council or the Judicial Library sent me uh, considerable material, uh, cases, et cetera. So a lot of people have worked very hard uh, doing research, uh, uh, for which I really appreciate uh, their efforts. Uh, but I also want to make sure that uh, I don't skip over other people who, uh, uh, who were so helpful to me when I was on the Court of Appeal. I didn't view my job here, and I say here because we're at the Court of Appeal in San Diego, as a solo performance. Uh, I uh, had uh, help uh, materially aided by wonderful, wonderfully capable research uh, attorneys, uh, Bill Dato, now Judge Dato, for about 10 years of the almost 17 years I was on the Court of Appeal, uh, Buzz Kinnaird uh, for the first three years when I started here, Paula Huey, who's now at the Court of Appeal in uh, the Third Appellate District, and Melanie Gold, who is uh, here working with Justice Haller. And uh, they were assisting me after we were assigned uh, two research lawyers. I, I did receive, obviously, valuable assistance from a number of other research lawyers who were with me for one or two years. Uh, as well as a substantial number of externs. These are students who, uh, from law schools whose insight and work and skills were really terrific. Uh, and I cannot ignore uh, the research lawyers on central staff uh, who worked on selected matters, including writs. And uh, they were always available to brainstorm concerns that I had or research issues that I uh, thought were important. And I really would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the clerk's office uh, a lot of wonderful people who I won't try to identify who, from my perspective, were always cooperative. I uh, would feel guilty if I didn't highlight uh, Steve Kelly's wonderful leadership. He's still here at the clerk's office. He was here either when I arrived in 1978 or shortly thereafter. And I, uh, he's just a wonderful guy, a lot of fun to be with, wonderfully capable. And I think it's really quite remarkable that he's dealt with the egos of all the justices so well uh, during the last 20 years. <clears throat> so uh, sorry for the lengthy monologue, but uh, I want to make sure I thanked all those people. Well, it was very gracious, as always, and I'm sure everyone will appreciate it. I, I'd like to start by asking you some questions about your background, your family. Um, if you would, would you just please tell us a little bit about your family and where you grew up? 
Well, I was born on February 1, 1931. My brother had been born four years earlier, Providence, Rhode Island. The times are interesting, uh, i.e. post-depression. Uh, one of the, the checklists from the uh, Judicial Council obviously made me reflect on issues that I might not have uh, reflected on. And I think the reality is that my childhood was typical of kids at that time and place. And when I say uh, time, i.e. the 30s, place, Providence is a small community, population then it's about a quarter of a million. The state at that time had a population of maybe three quarters of a million. Uh, my grandparents had emigrated from uh, Russia, a product of the pogroms in Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, they wanted to live the American dream. They were very sensitive to education, very much immersed in the uh, uh, Jewish community in Providence. It was a small community, looking back on it, less than one and a half percent of the population. Uh, and so we were a, quote, typical Jewish family growing up in a, you know, typical environment. Uh, my grandfather really did live the American dream. He was very successful in business, made a lot of money. Uh, and my dad, who was from Belfast, Ireland, uh, again, the notion of uh, an Irishman uh, speaking Yiddish with an Irish brogue <laughs> wasn't typical. Uh, and to that extent, we were a little bit unique. But uh, he had a small store in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, after more or less uh, unsuccessful venture in importing Irish linen. And he had wanted to be a singer, a uh, terrible businessman. Uh, and so consequently, we were uh, bluntly uh, uh, the poor relations in a relatively uh, wealthy uh, setting uh, in a community that, frankly, was compartmentalized. You know, the Irish live one place. the so-called colored, now African-Americans live in another section of town. And so we were really part of a Jewish community. And looking back, it's interesting uh, how narrow, uh, at least in my mind now, the scope of our social life uh, was. But went to public school, uh, played a lot of sports, had a pleasant time. Where did you play? Uh, everything. You know, in those days we didn't have organized uh, teams, you know, like uh, the soccer moms we have now. Uh, you know, you'd pick up a football game on the street to uh, uh, tag football, then you go to the field and you'd play tackle football and baseball in the lot not too far away. And you'd walk from your house or you'd take uh, uh, your bike. Uh, you didn't have to worry about a lot of things that uh, parents worry about now. And uh, there'd always be a game on Sundays. There'd always be a game at the playground for softball with different ages. So you just got immersed with kids and had a good time. Did you have any hobbies when you were a child? Uh, I think I had some <coughs> unsuccessful hobbies, uh, trying to make uh, model airplanes unsuccessfully and uh, <laughs> others. But I think it was sort of sports and hanging out with the kids. Nothing. Uh, our house wasn't particularly... Uh, 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 intellectual, uh, social, uh, <laughs> no television to speak of, uh, the radio, you know, Sunday night you listen to Jack Benny, but, uh, uh, or The Shadow, uh, names that probably don't ring a bell with anybody <laughs> except uh, a few uh, of my contemporaries, but uh, no, it, was a, it was a pleasant environment. My mother played the piano, my brother played the piano, my dad, as I say, trained to be a singer, so we'd, you know, in uh, comfortable times uh, would have some fun around the piano. Are there any events uh, from your childhood that stand out in your mind as having a particular impact on you? You know, it's a good question, and the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, it was a pleasant time. You know, at the time, you know, uh, uh, 1941, uh, December 7th, you know, I remember what I was doing when Pearl Harbor was born, you know, rushing home. You know, I'm 10 years of age, and the environment changed dramatically. You know, people rushed off to join the service. It was uh, scary. Uh, an, an anxious time, uh, you know, at, remember at school you'd have uh, planning for what happened if there were bombings, you'd sit, and so there were drills, uh, bomb drills and things of that sort. But uh, it's always a nervous time for four or five years, you know, rationing of food, rationing of gasoline, uh, you know, you'd see 
I was a kid, and of course news was uh, more carefully uh, censored, shall I say. You know, you didn't see the horribles that you see today, uh, but you'd see the blue stars in the windows of the homes where people were in the service, and then you'd see the gold stars where uh, uh, young men and women were killed. And so it was an uh, anxious time. Uh, so I don't know if that fills in any of the blanks. It does, it does. Um, I, if we may skip to college uh, <laughs> at this point, um, uh, where did you go to college? Well, I went to the public schools in Providence, uh, Hope High School. Uh, my mother had gone there. And, uh, uh, you know, nothing, I mean, it was a, a pleasant time, nothing dramatic. My memory of school was that uh, they would have uh, uh, classes for some of us who were planning to go to college and then different classes for those who wanted to go into a trade. And so although there was no dialogue on it, uh, people sort of knew where they were heading. And so uh, uh, I went to Brown and uh, I think as a product of the Times, depression and product of our family where Money was unfortunately uh, a a uh, dominant concern, and my father's uh, lack of skill in business, uh, for a whole series of reasons, uh, I elected to become uh, financially independent when I was about 15. So, oh, well, uh, let's talk about that before we go so to college. I, then. I, Tell uh, us about that. Uh, I, uh, if we stop there just for a moment. As a result of that, and I won't get into details, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there's some psychological baggage that uh, I won't burden uh, <laughs> uh, any viewer with, but uh, so I had a lot of jobs. Uh, you know, I worked at a delicatessen store, I drove a truck, I worked in the post office during Christmas. Uh, I, my dad had a store and I, it was shades and Venetian blinds and curtains, so I hung up shades from probably age uh, 11 or 12. And, every state building in the state of Rhode Island and homes, et cetera. And so, you know, I realized that, A, I didn't want to be poor, and B, that uh, I didn't want to hang up shades. You know, you climb up some of the places, which, to say the least, were uh, dirty. Uh, and you, th you know, you dust off a lot of junk, and you're, you know, 15 feet off the floor without all the power tools you have now. You know, and you'd work, 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 and then the shade wouldn't fit. I, I knew that uh, <laughs> I want to do something other than hang shades for the rest of my life. So I knew I had to get an education, but I was never very good uh, then or now uh, seeking advice, uh, uh, doing homework before planning. Didn't have a mentor, uh, didn't have a confidant. I'm sure there were facilities at school, uh, vocational guidance kind of things that I didn't take advantage of. So if you don't have any money and you're from Providence, you know, you only go to one school, either Brown or University of Denver, Rhode Island College, and, or Providence College, and I went to Brown. And uh, uh, so, again, it was sort of happenstance, uh, not an awful lot of thought. So I'm at, at college uh, without any great degree of planning. And what did you major in? I uh, majored in philosophy, uh, again, without uh, an awful lot of predetermination, pre just is this area that I thought would be interesting. Uh, was it? I'd enjoy. Yeah, I enjoyed it. it. It wasn't nearly as rigorous as other majors, I'm sure. You know, uh, for a while I thought maybe I should be a doctor, but all I'd see in the microscope were my eyelashes, and uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't uh, have the skills for science. Uh, I realized early on I didn't have the skills for spatial relations, so engineering was out. Uh, so I ended up in philosophy, and uh, I did enjoy it. I thought it was great. I thought Brown was a great school. I had a great time. Uh, but again, uh, work there, uh, you know, various jobs, building the grounds. Uh, and again, you don't know how it impacts your life, but uh, Brown alumni rave about uh, President uh, Riston, former President Brown. His son, you know, was uh, Walter Riston was a famous banker, et cetera. But my memory of the president is not only his lectures at, when you took chapel, mandatory chapel, one day a week, but I was moving furniture in his house and I was about to hit a wall and he came in and started yelling at me and I didn't think he was particularly kind. So uh, 
uh, so my image of the present then is uh, different than others. Uh, so, uh, but I like Brown. It was fun. It was good, uh, good classes. Uh, I was active socially. Went to all the football games. Refereed again to earn money. Uh, all the sports: uh, basketball, football, uh, softball. Uh, played intramural. It was a good time. Fun. Was it while you were in college that you decided to go to law school or to apply? Well, if I haven't made this clear, I don't think I'm uh, Columbo, you know, the uh, actor on television, but in terms of stumbling about, uh, but uh, with all due respect to me, uh, I think I, my mind might fit that uh, picture. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to have some kind of autonomy. I wanted to, I didn't want to be poor. Uh, I wanted to do something that uh, was important without getting my arms around that and without having any great skills. I think I was relatively shy. Uh, I think I was very sensitive to people. And I'd gone to court a few times because of interest in the law. And uh, uh, I was. Uh, really liked uh, the courtroom. I thought it was uh, exciting. I thought it would be a grand adventure. I was intrigued with the skills. I was intrigued with the drama. So I thought I'd try law school because I didn't know what else to do. Didn't, want to, didn't want to get a job. So, <clears throat> Do you remember how you, what uh, took you to a courtroom while you were, you know, before you were a law student? Uh, what did I want to do when I grew up kind of thing. Oh. Uh, a search that is never ending. And uh, I was on a, uh, they had a court system at Brown, and I ended up participating in that as a uh, sort of a judge and then also an advocate for certain issues. And so I wanted to see what courts uh, were like. So I went down to the courts in where I was, a handsome courthouse in, in uh, uh, Providence, yeah. and sort of hung out for a few hours at a time. Well, once you made the decision that you wanted to go to law school, um, did you apply to a number of law schools, or how did you sort yeah. that out? <laughs> yeah, again, it's interesting. In terms of themes, uh, I suspect one theme comes through is sort of stumbling. Is I didn't ask anybody again, didn't have any guidance, didn't examine my own personality, which I should have done. Uh, and so I applied to two law schools. I applied to Harvard, I applied to Yale. I wrote a letter to each of them saying I'd go to the law school if they could pay me some money which again, didn't realizing it, I was invoking the chutzpah principle. Uh, and much to my surprise, I got a letter back, uh, I don't know if I was surprised or not, I don't know what I expected, a very nice letter from Yale, I was accepted at Yale, and said, you know, we don't give scholarships to first year students, we'll loan you some money. And I wasn't sophisticated enough to appreciate what a loan meant. Uh, and Harvard said, yes, uh, we did have a scholarship for those persons who had graduated from a Providence public high school. A chap by the name of Charles Smith had given a fund of money to uh, uh, entrust, half of which went to maintain the Providence public parks. The other half went to any student who had graduated from Providence public high school. Uh, and since I fit that category, before I started Harvard, I had a full scholarship for tuition. Uh, before any viewer gets excited about that, Tuition for the first two years was $600 a, a year, and for the last year, $800. So my $2,000 for three years was paid for. Interestingly, before finals in my first year, I received a letter from Harvard saying I had qualified for the scholarship for the second year, which, of course, was a mystery that I certainly enjoyed. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your law school experience. Did you like law school? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> they, <laughs> Why not? Uh, you, you know, what happens as you move down the timeline, I think you appreciate who you are and your characteristics and the strengths of your personality. And, and uh, 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 I was anxious at law school because I found it a very elitist environment. I found it a very competitive environment. I thought the attitude was uh, overly competitive. You know, uh, I've since uh, uh, read and seen, uh, read the book 1L, I've seen the book 1L, you know, uh, uh, in other literature about uh, Harvard, you know, first year. That was my experience. I found it very uncomfortable. Uh, 
I was nervous in class being called upon. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable being ridiculed. Uh, I was startled at the priorities of the environment. It was an environment uh, geared to Wall Street. Uh, any lawyer who, you know, had the gall to be sense want to think about criminal law, uh, you know, they were out of the mainstream. Uh, anybody who, you know, hadn't graduated Phi Beta Kappa, Summa Cum Laude, uh, you know, was really looked upon uh, negatively. I, I thought it was an arrogant, uh, insensitive, overly competitive uh, environment. Uh, and uh, the professors uh, delighted in it, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, you know, Professor Kasner on real property, I never saw an ounce of humility in him, although he knew all the rules of incorporeal hereditaments. <laughs> uh, I thought that somebody like Warren Abner Seavey in, in agency uh, was uh, older, i.e. older, he was going to be 65. He showed a marvelous sensitivity, a marvelous warmth. I thought he was an exception. I thought so you he, do have some positive memories. Oh, yeah. I mean, Boston. again, one can't minimize the education. Uh, one can't minimize the skills of a Professor Freund or Archibald Cox. And some of the professors, you know, were really uh, wonderful. So I appreciated the good education. I think I appreciated uh, uh, the, the benefits of the education. I, I thought it was uh, unnecessarily uh, competitive and unnecessarily narrow. Uh, it was not a liberal uh, environment. I mean, quote, liberal is then a tolerant environment. You know, mine was the, uh, you know, Harvard graciously, two years earlier, I put graciously in quotes, you know, allowed women in for the first time. You know, that's outrageous to think it, it takes a, a couple of hundred years, you know, or to, to think maybe women should get a legal education. Uh, so there were, I think, 10 or 12 in our class. Uh, I have problems recalling any African American. I have problems recalling any Hispanic. It was a white male bastion. Uh, and uh, again, digressing from your question, I've been back since. Uh, Dean Kagan, frankly, has dealt with all of the issues that concern me. It's a much more user-friendly environment, much more sensitive to students, much greater scope of curriculum much greater scope of, of caring, both in terms of facilities, in terms of classes. Uh, it's just a much better place now. And when I was back there a few years ago uh, for my reunion, uh, and I did go to my 50th reunion, not many in between, is uh, one of my classmates uh, said in a rather critical manner, you know, she's no Dean Griswold. My reaction was, thank God. You know. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to minimize Dean Griswold, a great dean in many ways, you know, former solicitor general of the United States, certainly a very capable person, but he didn't, in my mind, bring the human qualities of law school. Uh, so I don't mean to spew it on the record, so to speak, but I spent a lot of time, again, playing basketball there. Derek Bach, who later became the president, was always on the basketball court. I didn't know how he was going to get through, but he managed to do well. Yes, I he guess did. today he's the president, again, of Harvard University. Well, did you find that having gone to Harvard Law School opened doors for you in your legal career? Uh, you know, again, it's uh, in my, my stumbling about, I'm sure there may have been facilities at Harvard uh, that I was unaware of to help me in terms of planning. I didn't take advantage of any of them, uh, either because I didn't know they were there or because I didn't have those skills. I was married in, at the end of my second year at Harvard. Uh, and so... Uh, I just decided to drive to California. My wife was from California, and uh, I thought I'd you know try it here. It wasn't a totally voluntary choice. Uh, Rhode Island at the time required a six-month clerkship without pay, and I had an uncle who was a lawyer, and I talked to some people who were lawyers in Rhode Island, and the notion that I needed a job with pay, uh, they were offended uh, to think I had the gall to ask them and so consequently, and I didn't have any money, so without any money, I got in a car with my wife and son, Daniel, who was, you know, crawling around the back seat. We just drove to California. I looked for a job. Where? So, so in that sense, uh, Harvard may have opened doors, may have had the ability to open doors. I, I just wasn't, 
I wasn't able to find them. I, I, for some reason, I just didn't see them. Uh, and, and again, the process either was so different then, or I, you know, I was so unaware of, I, yeah, I had to take a bar exam. I figured I'd go someplace and take a bar exam. I knew nothing about the process. Uh, and uh, Dana Latham, who was the uh, chair of, uh, uh, the founder of Latham and Watkins, you know, a famous law firm uh, now, was in charge of Harvard's uh, vocational placement at the time. And I wanted to see him right away, but I couldn't get in to see him for three or four weeks. So I signed up for a bar exam and knocked on doors. And William Mathis, who was a U.S. District Judge at the time Where? Uh, in Los Angeles, had uh, uh, agreed to interview people from Harvard who were looking for a job. So I met him. He was a very stern guy. I thought he was very old. As a result of preparing for this, I looked him up. Uh, you know, he was born. Uh, so he couldn't have been more than 57 or so when I met him. I thought he was, you know, ancient. Uh, <laughs> You know, now that I'm 76, doesn't, 57 <laughs> no. doesn't sound very old. Is uh, he was very nice, very stern, uh, uh, very Harvardian, uh, very had a talk about uh, jurisdiction and the precious jurisdiction of the U.S. district courts, uh, and uh, remember his scoffing about diversity jurisdiction. I didn't know what he's talking about, but. Uh, uh, Just smile and uh, nod. <laughs> yeah, yeah, except nodding. And so he said, oh, I'm going to hire either, I'll either hire you or Ben will hire you. So that's great. You know, I said, I don't know who Ben is. And uh, it turned out that Ben was Ben Harrison, a U.S., Benjamin Harrison, a U.S. district judge who had been appointed in 1940. And uh, uh, again, I looked up recently, he, in he was born in 1988. So, so again, I, I thought he was so old, but it turns out that he wasn't. Uh, and again, a total digression, but in terms of the times, uh, two items just uh, I find so interesting. He was nominated on June 11th, 1940. He was confirmed on June 23rd or 24th, 1940, and was sitting as a U.S. District Judge before July 1st, 1940. So we didn't have a lot of futsa futsa with the United States Senate uh, in those days. Apparently not. And what was so fascinating about Judge Harrison is uh, he had never gone to law school, never gone to college. He had studied independently in Needles, uh, California, had ultimately become the U.S. Attorney and then from there to the U.S. District Court. So I had gone from Harvard Law School in this uh, intellectual environment in which credentials were so crucial, uh, I didn't conceive coming out of Harvard, you could be a judge without having gone to college or law school. And I'm working for a very nice man uh, who uh, had never gone to college or law school. So it was a How long did you work for him? About a year. And, uh, uh, you know, as a law clerk. And this is a district court, so what was the work like? Uh, yeah, memos on cases that were pure in front of him. It was a different world. He had some uh, civil, some criminal. Uh, Judge Harrison reminded me of Gary Cooper, who some of the viewers, some of you may know, was an actor who didn't say very much. Uh, he'd walk in in the morning and say, uh, good morning, Howard. And my chambers, I mean, I'm as close to him as I am to you and the uh, camera here, very close. Uh, another room so I could hear everything that went on. Uh, civil cases, uh, jurisdictional issues, motions to dismiss, and all that. I mean, I'd taken a year of federal courts in law school and a semester of federal courts, another year of federal courts, federal procedure the first year, mm -hmm. federal courts the second, uh, at my third year. So I knew something about federal procedure. Uh, at least I thought I did. So uh, I was far more intellectual than he had any interest in being. He was not an academic guy. So in the morning he'd say, good morning, Howard, and at night he'd say, good night, Howard. Uh, but it was a different world in that it was less formal, and he was not a bureaucrat, very realistic guy. And uh, in those days, uh, criminal cases uh, were not voguish. And uh, there was a lawyer whose name was Maury Levine uh, who came, who did criminal work, which was not what, quote, good lawyers did. Uh, the criminal lawyers were either Italian or uh, Hispanic or Jewish, you know, they weren't, uh, quote, silk stocking firms. And Maury, I remember Maury Levine coming in one day and uh, saying to him, he said, morning, Ben. He says, morning, Mar 
Maury, how are you? Fine. He says, Ben, I see I'm going to have a case in front of you. He says, like hell you are. <laughs> he said, I just filed it, Ben. It has your initials on it. And he says, uh, that's true. He said, but I sent it down to Bill. He said, well, why'd you do that, Ben? He said, and I could, you know, hear this. <laughs> he says, this is a judge talking. He says, well, he says, uh, the last case you had in front of me, Maury, you appealed. He says, uh, Ben, I needed the fee. And he says, Ben, he's, needing the fee is one thing. But reversing me is another. <laughs> so he just kicks the case out. Uh, so <laughs> it was a little different world. And uh, uh, they didn't have bailiffs. Uh, uh, they had pals, the U.S. District Judge, who served as bailiffs. And uh, so Judge Harrison had Jack, who would drive his car and sit in the courtroom, et cetera, no guns and not an awful lot of formality. Well, Jack got sick, uh, and so I was a bailiff for three or four or five or six weeks, and I saw some marvelous trials, some absolutely marvelous trials. Uh, I saw a trial of uh, Rita Hayworth, again an actress of some note years ago, versus Columbia Pictures. And there's a law firm now, Mitchell Silberberg and Nupp, and Mr. Nupp was in the courtroom, and he was assisted by Macklin Fleming, who later became a court of appeal justice on the state side. He had graduated from Yale. And I forget who represented Rita Hayworth. And so before the case, I was a bailiff, so before the case started, Judge Harrison came to me and said, uh, Howard, he says, Guy Nup is a great lawyer. Yes, sir. So I'd go out, and Mr. Nup, I recall, was tall, and he had cowboy boots on. And uh, when Judge Harrison would take the bench, uh, everyone would stand and then sit down, and Judge and Guy Nup would sit there during this very exciting trial, uh, morning and afternoon. And then before Judge Harrison left, he'd say, Howard, that guy up is a great lawyer. He didn't do a thing, just sat there. Day after day after day, went on for two weeks, every day, guy up is a great lawyer. Yes, sir. And at the beginning of the third week, Mr. Nupp stood up and said to Judge, I think we should see you in chambers. Certainly. So they adjourned. And uh, they all in chambers, all the lawyers, the party's not there. And Mr. Nupp says to uh, uh, Judge, he says, Ben, I think we should settle this case. Whatever you say, guy. <laughs> so the case gets settled. He co Judge Harrison comes in. He says, that guy Nupp is a great lawyer. So, you know, it's a, so I'm learning about the law biz from the inside. It's a little different than I expected. Uh, and when I left, uh, Judge Harrison liked me, and I really liked him, although not an awful lot of schmoozing. Uh, uh, he gave me advice. Uh, he helped me. He wanted me to work for the U.S. Attorney, and uh, I, I didn't go down that path. And the advice he gave me, we're looking out the window and told me where his aunt had lived, et cetera, near the U.S. District Courthouse in L.A. And uh, he said, uh, now remember, Howard, always tell the truth and never take a mining claim instead of a fee. Uh, and at the time, I was so taken by the brevity of this wisdom. But over the years, uh, I've just been so impressed with how profound it is. And when I've taught class in professional responsibility, I talk about that. It probably says everything. So as you gather, I liked the experience. It was very interesting. I met a lot of people. And uh, it was, I enjoyed it. What did you do after you clerked for him? Well, again, in my stumbling mode, and I don't mean to stress that, again, I didn't uh, go down traditional paths for Harvard uh, lawyers. Uh, in my initial quest, I had met, as I say, I met interview with Dana Latham. And I did not realize at that time there was discrimination amongst law firms and that Jewish lawyers uh, would have problems uh, being hired. I thought discrimination was only in the East Coast and not on the West Coast. And I had had an interview with a lawyer who had with the Nossman firm before I was to meet uh, Mr. Latham. And I t he told me, and I, he asked me where I was going to go. And I said, well, I'm going to go to O'Melveny and Myers and Gibson Dunn and Crutcher. And he scoffed at that. He said, that's ridiculous. I said, well, excuse me, sir, I'm all 24 years of age. Uh, I said, I don't know why you're laughing. He says, you're doing this wrong. He said, you have to go see Isaac Pact at Ross Warren uh, Bernhardt and Pact because he's Jewish. You have to go to Loeb and Loeb. You have to go to Mitchell Silberberg and Nupp. 
He says, don't go to those firms. It's a waste of time. And so I remember that so vividly for a couple of reasons. One is he was so outspoken, smoking a little cigar all the time and using the F word, which I didn't know people with white hair would use the F word. <laughs> so here it is. He had bluntly told me I'm wasting my time because these firms discriminate against uh, uh, Jewish uh, lawyers. And so I had seen Mr. Latham and looking, it was very nice to me, uh, very pleasant and consistent with my naivete at the time uh, while we're talking about opportunities in uh, Los Angeles and where you could help. I asked him, uh, and again looking back on it, uh, it's so naive, it's, it's shocking, but I did turn to Mr. Latham and I said, excuse me, sir, I understand from Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Brady, my memory of his name, Mr. Brady told me that your firm will not hire Jewish lawyers. Uh, and I remember a long pause and Mr. Latham saying quite graciously, and uh, he said, you're going to be a great lawyer. You ask very good questions. Uh, so I wasn't hired uh, and made a judgment call that maybe I had to change <coughs> paths in terms of my job search and Harvard wasn't going to help me. And uh, so I knocked on some doors and uh, met a lot of lawyers uh, and met a chap named Paul Egley, who for lo people from Los Angeles would know that name because he later became a judge and he was the uh, busing uh, judge in the mm -hmm. Crawford versus Board of Education. But he was a lawyer in Covina and uh, we talked about what we saw for the law practice. You know, I had one of my contemporaries had gone to Lola Felix and Hall, they represented Standard Oil. Another chap from law school had gone uh, to Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, another to Music, Peter and Garrett. They're all major law firms in Los Angeles. So I ended up in Covina uh, with Paul Egley uh, in the general practice in a very famous firm called Egley and Weiner. So I was out on was my Was it own just the two of you? At that time. And what kind of work did you do? <laughs> uh, Covina was a small community at that time. and. Uh, uh, to give you the setting, and you're not going to believe this because uh, I have a problem believing it, we had a very small office. Uh, it was like uh, you'd open up the front door and there was a hallway down with three little rooms. His was the front room, a middle room, and I was in the back office, uh, very small, on uh, 151 East Bedillo Street in Covina. And, quote, we did everything. Paul was a veteran. He was 10 years older than I am. He had uh, very well educated, wonderfully smart, wonderfully creative, had gone to Covina schools, had received a field commission on the service, uh, very charismatic, a lot of fun. And so we had a selective clientele. We took anything that walked at the door. Uh, but to give you the picture, when I first started, uh, we had a library in that middle room that consisted of the Witkin books. Uh, I think there were two, a green one and a blue one. Maybe it was a green one and a red one. One was procedure, and the other was substance. That was our library. And Paul's wife, uh, Marion, uh, a, a, had been from Germany. She was back in Europe at the time. And uh, Paul's task, when I first went with him, was to take care of their parakeet, Manny. So there were the two Witkin books and Manny in a cage in the library. And so that was our physical setting. Uh, we had a royal manual typewriter. And I had a business deal with Paul. I was always a superb negotiator. And I negotiated a business deal with Paul that uh, he would guarantee me $200 a month. So I married, have a kid. And I left working for Judge Harrison at $72 net weekly for $200 a month net that he was to pay me uh, if I didn't get paid from any other source. And the first day I was there, a woman walked in who wanted a divorce. So I asked our secretary, Dora, I said, uh, do we handle divorces? She said, we do, Howard. <laughs> uh, and uh, I said, are there papers? She said, yes. And I said, what do we charge? And she said, oh, $275. And so I said to this person, it's $275, and she gave me $275. So I never, so Paul never had to pay me, and we were off running. 
uh, and uh, which uh, I suspect Harvard lawyers start differently now, now and maybe start differently then. But uh, well, one of my contemporaries from law school, I remember meeting in the <coughs> first two or three or four years, was going into court for his 11th accounting of the Harvey Mudd estate. I think I was in downtown L.A. on one of my bigger, you know, uh, more significant misdemeanor trials. So uh, uh, I tried a lot of stuff, uh, you know, a lot of misdemeanor trials and felony trials and just everything. And then as I, we grew in the practice, the firm grew, uh, we became respectable, we developed a clientele. We had a very good law practice. So I practiced there. Uh, for uh, 19 years. I was just going to ask you that. Um, wh while you were there, were you uh, active in the local bar? Yeah, I used the, I was very comfortable with lawyers. Uh, it was a different world then. Uh, the Citrus Municipal Court had just started in Covina. And uh, it uh, was in a, a building, not a courthouse. And there was a judge there, uh, and this is a total digression, but Al Miller. And he had been a su successful lawyer in Cincinnati, so now I'm maybe, you know, 28, 29 years of age and routinely going to the Citrus Court to handle cases, you know, misdemeanor petty thefts, drunk drivings, et cetera. One of the great trial lawyers of Covina. And uh, I didn't understand it, but uh, uh, Judge Miller, when he would take pleas, and all the cases were negotiated in those days without an awful lot of formality, uh, he would impanel a jury to take pleas. And I never understood why there'd be a jury in the box and we would end up entering a plea and a fine of $150 or something to a drunk driver case. And ultimately the truth came out is he wanted, he, Judge Miller, wanted to have more judges in a huge courthouse. And so he would send the data in to the Judicial Council that these pleas were jury trials. And so in a given day, one judge is handling more jury trials than occurred in the history of man. So when the Judicial Council is getting this data and then it goes to the legislature for more judges, he was able to say, we need two, three, four, five judges. And so, again, I was so naive, I didn't understand what was happening. While somebody was, you know, jiggling the figures, so to speak, uh, so for no other reason than to augment uh, the courthouse. And so, so... Uh, uh, again, in terms of bar activity, I was very active. We had the Citrus Knife and Fork Club where we got together. The lawyers were of a wide variety. Uh, there was anybody else. There was no one else from Harvard, but there were a lot of uh, lawyers, very well trained, uh, background, uh, varying ages, all very social. Uh, one's word was one's bond. Uh, then that bar became a more formal bar, and then the Pomona Valley Bar Association, and I became the president of both. And then I later was on the board of trustees of the L.A. County Bar Association, and then ultimately elected to the State Bar Board of Governors. So the bar really when was, was that? My, 1972. So the bar really was my constituency, and uh, so I was elected in 1972. At that time, uh, one, by legislation, the L.A. District uh, required one person who, uh, uh, had a, who had an office outside of Los Angeles. And again, uh, they had a, quote, so-called breakfast club of the establishment bar, and the establishment bar, you know, would nominate somebody at the breakfast club, and that person would routinely get elected. Uh, that was the first time, however, that they had a contested election between... Uh, 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 lawyers from the uh, plaintiff's trial bar uh, who were uncomfortable with the breakfast club controlling things. So I had a chap uh, run against me, and so I was the establishment uh, lawyer. People who knew me thought it was ludicrous uh, and humorous and ironic, uh, but it was the first time there had been a contest for the uh, uh, bar, so I was elected. George Hilsinger, a trial lawyer, does defense work, still alive was elected by the uh, uh, trial lawyers. Uh, Joe Cachette, now a famous lawyer, was elected uh, in Northern California. Uh, 
And uh, so that started a three-year term, which took a lot of time and very, very interesting. And worthwhile? Oh, very worthwhile. And uh, the district attorney of uh, San Diego County, Bonnie DeMontis, is on the board. That was very worthwhile for a whole host of reasons. Uh, you learn about, you see law in a different context. You see how people practice. Uh, Seth Huffstetler was on the board. You know, Shirley Huffstetler is, uh, w was then on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, uh, Leonard Janowski was president, later became president of the American Bar Association. You know, Paul Hastings, Janowski, and Walker. So it was an uh, interesting group. Uh, met the Chief Justice, uh, dined with the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, it just an eye opener. You said you were with your that your firm for 19 years. Was the next step a judgeship? Yes. And how did that come about? Uh, in the in the in the uh, for process of fortuities and not planning, uh, because uh, there are some people who look at you uh, and they label you, can you help me or not, and put you in another category. I've never looked at people that way. I never had a grand plan. I've always assumed if you're, you know, pleasant enough and uh, conscientious enough, somehow uh, the luck gods and the fortune gods will smile on you. And, uh, you know, there is a rule for merit. And uh, so uh, I developed a pretty good reputation practicing law. I tried a lot of different cases, had a lot of different experiences. Uh, I had small businesses starting by, uh, you know, uh, Frankie DeSalvo, who's driving a dump truck when he starts, ends up selling that business to uh, to Union Oil. We represented a lot of people in the rock and gravel industry. So we, we had a very good law practice, uh, ranging from a lot of doctors and a lot of lawyers and construction people, eight or nine lawyers. Uh, you know, I had a couple of secretaries. So I'm pretty successful as a lawyer doing in general practice still. Uh, and the, and interestingly, uh, when I called up one of my former partners to talk about today, Jane Egley, uh, practiced law, and she married, happened to marry Paul, but uh, she said, well, what you have to stress is that you're, you and your firm were so different. We hired Jane in 1972, and she said at that time, uh, we were one of the few law firms, even then, hiring women. And she explained to me in my phone call with her recently, it was the single best job she ever had because at no time did she face any hostility or discrimination. And I didn't realize, you know, that's on the vanguard. And it was in a firm in which Art Baldonado was one of my uh, partners. He later became a uh, judge. Uh, we had, he was a Hispanic uh, chap from Los Angeles. Now, I didn't know you're not supposed to hire Hispanics in those days. I thought. Mexican Americans are here first. You know, I didn't realize there was discrimination against uh, Mexicans. So, so our firm was diverse, without trying to be, do the politically correct thing. We were nice people who are good lawyers, and so uh, 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 a fellow by the name of Bill McVitie uh, was running for the assembly in uh, in San Bernardino County, and Bill was a lawyer. And uh, uh, this is in 1973 or so. And he was uh, alleged to have done some improper things in the election process, violating highly technical provisions of the highly uh, technical provisions of the elections code. And in any event, uh, so the district attorney of San Bernardino County uh, filed a complaint against him. And uh, he wanted a lawyer who he thought would do a good job, so he hired me. And to make a long story short, uh, 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 we resolved the matter in a satisfactory way. And lo and behold, Bill gets elected to the assembly, much to everybody's surprise, including mine. But he was a very good campaigner, <clears throat> a very nice guy. And uh, I wanted to be a judge at that time. So uh, uh, as a result of uh, that, experience, people in the legislature thought I knew something about uh, elections law code. So I was called by a few people in the legislature to represent them. Uh, again, a digression. One of the tenants from the space uh, we leased in West Covina was Chuck Wiggins, who 
became a Ninth Circuit judge, but before then he was in the Congress. And he was a very, he was a key player in the Watergate hearings. And uh, he was viewed as a brilliant constitutional lawyer. And he had uh, been a lawyer in El Monte with a very modest practice. So I was having lunch with him while he was on that committee where the hearings, Watergate hearings are going on. I said to him, I said, Chuck, I don't understand this. You were a lawyer in El Monte. I mean, you had maybe a modest divorce once in a while. I said, now you're being billed in the LA Times as a brilliant constitutional lawyer. He said, Howard, you have to understand one thing in life. He said, it is not who you are. It's what the New York Times says you are. Uh, and I think that happened to me because people in the legislature thought I knew something. So I met some. McVitie's in the legislature. He called. He said, you want to be a judge? Your name is in. Why don't you apply to San Bernardino County? I said, I don't live in San Bernardino. He said, well, that'd be poetic justice, wouldn't it? Uh, I lived in Claremont not too near the border, so I got appointed. Uh, well, wait, was, I, I knew that Tony Klein, uh, who was Governor Brown's uh, appointment secretary, and uh, so I got appointed. So, uh, And I wasn't particularly well received because uh, the presiding justice was angry that a Los Angeles uh, lawyer, perceived liberal Democrat, uh, would be appointed uh, as a uh, judge in San Bernardino. So you were appointed to the Superior Court by Governor Jerry Brown? That's correct. How long were you on that court? Uh, two and a half years. Um, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, in all candor, it was not a, a welcoming experience. The presiding justice uh, was angry about it, and he handled it in a uh, uh, interesting manner. How was that? Uh, he made clear that I had a uh, uh, welcoming ceremony in which I could only invite limited guests, and instead of the usual celebratory event, it was a very... Uh, I could only have X number of people, et cetera, all of which was uh, uh, unnecessary, and he was simply wrong. And he assigned cases to me to make sure to embarrass me. Uh, the first case I had was uh, a criminal case, a modest criminal case. The third case was a death penalty case. Uh, and so, although I knew something about misdemeanors and knew something about mechanics lands, I knew as much about a death penalty case as the videographer who, although a guru on computers, I'm sure, <laughs> is, could not handle a, a death penalty trial. Uh, and so, uh, but much to his surprise, uh, uh, very good lawyers. You know, I did my homework. Uh, we had a trial. So the bar was very appreciative of my being there. I was, uh, they viewed me as a breath of fresh air. Uh, they realized I was being uh, discriminated against in that uh, being thrown a tough weight. The lawyers were marvelous. Uh, three quarters of the bench were very gracious. Uh, so it was sort of a divisive, but uh, uh, it was a great experience. I loved San Bernardino. I really enjoyed being a trial court judge. The fourth case I had was the Whitey Kolozak was a hitman for the uh, mafia, transporting 2,000 pounds of marijuana. Uh, and then I was appointed uh, as presiding judge of the family law calendar, uh, which uh, the presiding judge thought I uh, was entitled to. Uh, but again, I thought it was marvelous. I just thought uh, that was a great experience. I went upstairs, I remember, to the sixth floor, explained to the clerk that I was newly appointed, and I was in charge of family law, and she started to cry. And I asked her, is there a reason that you're <laughs> crying? And she says she'd been there for umpteen years, 15, 16 years. She had never had a judge go from the third floor to the sixth floor mm -hmm. to introduce himself. And she was so excited about the opportunity of working with somebody who was going to help her deal with the calendar, because what the presiding judge had done to embarrass uh, Governor Brown was he had put a moratorium on civil cases and uh, had uh, elected uh, not to hear any more civil cases, so the backlog was building up. And so she and I drafted a, a program where we just put all the cases on the calendar, told everybody there's going to be a trial date coming up, and of course 80 percent panicked and settled the cases. Uh, and so we ended up being current in about uh, four or five or six months. But it was a great experience. The bar was great. Cases were interesting. I had a great time. 
Let's um, now turn to the Court of Appeal. Uh, I assume you applied at some point to the yeah. Court of Appeal. And what led to that decision? Uh, <laughs> you know, I like the trial court, uh, but it seemed to me that I figured out somewhere along the way I could handle the Court of Appeal issues. Uh, I was nervous initially whether I had the capability. And uh, I ultimately concluded I did have the skill. Uh, I thought it'd be, uh, I, I thought I could do something of greater public impact. I thought the cases would uh, be uh, more challenging. I thought it'd be intellectually stimulating. I just thought it was uh, the, the, the impact on, on uh, both the law and society uh, would be greater. Uh, I thought I could do the job, and I, it was just time to try something different. Was that uh, Governor Brown? Yeah, and yes, uh, uh, and uh, the timing was right. Uh, uh, the people who had then Governor Brown appointed to the San Bernardino were very conscientious. Uh, we literally cleaned up the calendar. We were current by the time I left. Uh, and San Bernardino is in the fourth appellate district. Uh, and even though I hadn't uh, been a resident of the county, uh, I'd been reelected. So uh, I was well regarded. And an event occurred in uh, San Diego. I was told that there was a disagreement as to who to appoint. So it was suggested I apply. And I did. And much to my surprise, I was appointed to the Court of Appeal. Uh, who was on the court, the Court of Appeal, at the time you joined it? A little drink of water. I didn't know I could talk this much that fast, so this is interesting. Uh, you picture the scene. I'm in San Bernardino, and uh, again, uh, life at the Superior was different than I anticipated uh, for a whole series of reasons. Uh, I was so excited. Uh, Governor Brown had called me, told me he was appointed. I left uh, my chambers and I bumped into a colleague who I had known for a long time and said, I've just been appointed the Court of Appeal. And he said, uh, uh, he looked at me making eye contact and said, uh, who's going to handle the calendar here? Uh, which uh, <laughs> puzzled me then. So judges are interesting. Uh, I have to say that uh, there are a lot of special judges. Uh, but I've always found it, uh, I've always been more comfortable being with lawyers than I have been with judges. Uh, I find lawyers uh, somewhat more energized and frankly, uh, maybe even more healthy uh, psychologically, uh, bold and overstated as that comment may be. So I arrive in uh, Justice Brown, Gerald Brown was a presiding justice at that time. He was in his early 60s. I knew nothing about the court's appeal. Uh, uh, except uh, Chief Justice uh, Byrd uh, had assigned me as a trial court judge to both the San Bernardino Court of Appeal and the L.A. Court of Appeal. So I'd spent five months during a two-and-a-half-year period on assignment to the Court of Appeal, uh, which uh, was an interesting learning experience. Uh, so I, so Justice Brown wanted me to meet with him and the other justices before the confirmation process. And I was puzzled about that because it seemed to me that I shouldn't be talking to anybody until I was confirmed. Uh, and I don't recall whether I deviated from uh, his request and held off, but I don't think I did. So I think I met with him and Justice Robert Staniforth and Justice Cologne uh, before I was confirmed, uh, or at least yeah, before I was confirmed. Uh, and I remember driving down from Claremont, where I lived on the highway, and I had directions, because I had rarely been in San Diego, and it seemed like a long distance from uh, Claremont. And I remember I had to take off on Front Street off the freeway, and I had to find the state building. And we went into, I went to the state building of the sixth floor, and it was a very awkward setting. Justice Brown 
who I got to know very well, uh, was different. Uh, he was uh, You want to elaborate? Uh, he was awkward <laughs> socially, and uh, people who are watching this who know Jesse Brown know exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Uh, but he marched to a different drummer. He, uh, he liked music. He liked literature. Uh, he had an impeccable memory, the most remarkable memory imaginable. And so if you were having a conversation with him at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon and he was telling you about the automobile ride he took with his older brother to Annapolis in the 30s and that conversation was broken up, at Monday morning he'd meet you in your chambers and continue the sentence from where he left off. It's it just different. Uh, which required some adjustment in terms of, of schmoozing. Uh, not a regular guy in so many ways. And I remember the awkward setting. There, I sat in a chair similar to this, and the three of them sat across from me uh, in order, i.e., Brown, Cologne, Staniforth. Staniforth also was somewhat awkward socially, uh, and we had an awkward conversation where I met them, and uh, I then got in my car and drove home. And then, you know, we had the confirmation of proceeding, et cetera. Uh, and I end up then in San Diego. Thank you. Uh, it was a relatively formal environment, and uh, some events uh, stick out so clearly. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't really know much about the job. Uh, I was given, essentially given a research lawyer, Buzz Kinnaird uh, was my research lawyer. He had worked for uh, Justice Staniforth and uh, Justice Cologne, and so he knew the ropes uh, better than I did. Uh, I found the job very difficult. Uh, what, was, what was interesting to me was, uh, again, structure. At the f I had a bundle of cases, they gave me a bundle of cases, uh, six, seven, eight cases uh, were mine. Uh, given randomly uh, the lead justice uh, system that you have here, and we can get into that more in, uh, in a moment. But uh, the first oral argument, uh, I believe, is in June, and so Justice uh, Brown said, uh, we're to take the bench on a certain day. Uh, and I said, okay, but there are four of us. And uh, he said, that's right. I said, but there are only, I think, uh, <laughs> Gerald, there only three on the panel. He said, well, that's true, uh, but uh, it's inefficient if we change. So there are four justices. There. I said, well, do you tell the lawyers, you know, who they should be arguing to? No. So I recall sitting there, not on the panel, but I'm sitting there and some lawyers arguing in front of me, and I want to say, hey, now you, <laughs> please, don't look at me. You know, I remember feeling so guilty, you know, I wrote, wrote, take, started taking notes. I felt <laughs> obliged because some poor chap uh, is, is arguing. And uh, so... Did that system persist for... No, no, no. At the end of the first uh, day, uh, apparently other people said, come on, you know, this is silly. And so we changed it. Well, another thing happened was uh, I notified the clerk's office. I said, I'd like the briefs in all the cases. And uh, I don't know if it was Steve or somebody else. I'm referring to Steve Kelly, but where it was, I'm, I was in the clerk's office physically to pick them up. And they're laughing. I uh, said, so what are you laughing at? Do you know you are the only justice who has ever asked for the briefs in all the cases? I said, well, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> they laughed. He said, you know what it means. <laughs> I couldn't get over that. Uh, I couldn't get over it from just a management perspective because why would you want research lawyers f for justices to know that they're not being examined or scrutinized or uh, cases analyzed from a perspective of the briefs. Because what happened is Justice Brown was proud that we were a, quote, a hot court, close quote. Which uh, means what? Well, Wednesday before oral argument would have a notebook uh, in which uh, the uh, memoranda would be prepared uh, for oral argument. Memoranda, bluntly, is a draft opinion. Draft opinion is the opinion. 
and we would not have uh, a pre-oral uh, argument conference, unlike my experience in Los Angeles and unlike my experience in San Bernardino and uh, on the Court of Appeal. So you take the bench, uh, you know, with uh, a several days preparation, but it would be a hard work week from Wednesday to the oral argument. And so you'd be reading the briefs before that time. Uh, and so I didn't understand how that did. But what was interesting, A, after I arrived and after the first setting, we went to changing seats at the Court of Appeal. There were three. And then each of the justices then said, oh, get me the briefs at a time because there are plenty of briefs around, et cetera. But uh, we were assigned uh, uh, six or seven uh, or eight cases, uh, plus there were by the court opinions uh, done primarily by Justice Brown. And it was an interesting uh, world in the sense with one research lawyer, you know, I'd take half the cases, uh, Buzz would take uh, half the cases, and uh, you do your own writing of cases. Uh, and uh, Justice Brown, uh, he had been a Rhodes Scholar, he had gone to Yale Law School with uh, uh, Wizard White. Uh, 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 his reputation was committed to Strunk and White, uh, no that's, no legalese, etc. A very good opinion writer. Uh, very much to the point. Justice Staniforth was relatively new. Justice Cologne, as you probably know, uh, had been in the legislature, had been appointed by uh, former Governor Reagan. Uh, and uh, very little dialogue, uh, a very efficient court uh, until I arrived, I guess, because I found the job very difficult in that there were bodies of law I didn't know. Uh, I was not a facile writer. I, I could not sit down in those days with either a typewriter or uh, early on computer and, and knock out something uh, easily. Uh, and I assumed that the lawyers who were making arguments were serious about the arguments. And if I didn't understand the arguments, I'd want to figure them out. And some of the arguments required more work than others. And since my law practice had been essentially, a, to a great extent, a people practice, uh, you know, how to, how to resolve problems for people uh, rather than a complex, uh, complex corporate acquisitions uh, and dotting I's or crossing T's in tax matters. Uh, you know, I was a solution-seeking person, but I didn't have access uh, to those sources anymore, and I thought we had to do the job that the Constitution required. Uh, and the Constitution says that the Court of Appeal, you have to give you reasons in writing with reasons stated. And uh, since I was sensitive to the practicing bar, I wanted to turn out a product they could understand. Uh, and I wanted to understand it. And since, although I didn't think I suffered from the imposter syndrome, I didn't have any illusions. And I wanted to make sure that I could do a job uh, that I could be proud of and that was consistent with the opportunity that had been given to me. So I found it a hard job with very few people to get insight from uh, because, uh, as I say, Justice Brown was in a, a hyper-decisional mode and he was interested in production. And uh, in the entire time I served with Justice Brown as presiding judge, we never resubmitted a case. We'd always decided probably the median time from time of oral argument to time of filing an opinion was probably 20 days. Uh, but as you say, there was a draft opinion at oral argument. That's right. And, and so signing off, I mean, there's an article written uh, that I've been familiar with called The One Judge and the No Judge Opinion, uh, uh, written by uh, Justice Thompson. Uh, Robert Thompson had been involved in that. Justice Huffstetler, Judge Huffstetler had been involved in that. There was concern with the power of staff, and essentially it was a staff-driven product with only one person, i.e. either the lead judge who was responsible for the draft opinion to be put in the notebook, or staff of the lead opinion. Uh, and that was all there was, and everyone would sign off. Uh, I thought the job entailed more. I thought it was a three-judge panel. And so I did uh, uh, homework. And early on, we had a case called People versus Pierce, 
that had been returned by the Supreme Court to the Court of Appeal in light of People versus Honeycutt, uh, which uh, interesting, I remember uh, certain aspects of it, dealing with jury misconduct it was a murder case. And I recall uh, going to oral argument, I recall a affirmance, uh, a again, a draft opinion affirming by Justice Brown, uh, signed off by Justice Cologne. And I was bothered by it. And I remember Justice Brown. I'm looking at uh, your cases here, uh, Cindy, you know, on a shelf uh, in back of you, and I had put People versus Peers on a shelf. I remember Justice Brown coming by and saying, Howard, we have to get it out. This is about a day after our argument. And I remember saying, Gerald, uh, you know, I want to do a little more homework on that. I remember just tapping his watch and saying, uh, oh, we have to get it out. And uh, I said, yes, uh, that's true. Uh, and uh, Rick Benish was on the Court of Appeal at that time. And, uh, in, as in an center, attorney. As an attorney, a central staff, lawyer here in San Diego in practice, and a very nice uh, chap. And he knew my concern of what was happening, and so I drafted a dissent in that case. Uh, Rick uh, was a sounding board, and I looked it up before today, and that uh, opinion, uh, my opinion, my it's dissent, and the majority was filed by the end of June, uh, again, within a 20, 25-day period, uh, the Supreme Court granted review and 7-0 agreed with the dissent. They reversed with instructions to send it back. Uh, That's nice. And it was a marvelous learning experience uh, for me uh, and very exciting in the sense I probably received uh, about six or seven letters from uh, judges on the court in San Diego saying, we don't know you, we've never met you, uh, but thank God you're here. Words to that effect, it's a breath of fresh air. We've not seen a dissent in years and years. Whether we agree with you is irrelevant, but at least now we have somebody who's going to be paying attention. Uh, the staff was uh, sensitized to it, for better or for worse. I never heard, I never had any dialogue by either Justices uh, Cologne or Brown on the outcome of that case. And so uh, part of my learning experience was that as, that as insular as the world is at the Court of Appeal, and as I think many people know, you know, there's a so-called Chicago experience where they put people in a room, uh, they put a person in a room with 11 or 15 or 20 or 30 other people and somebody writes X on the board and they write a, a zero, a lot of X's and a zero, and they go around the room and everyone's told to say, there are only X's up there. And if you're alone in that room, over 90% of the people are swayed by their peers and they say there are only X's up there when they see the zero. And uh, uh, in a lot of social, scientific, psychological data that way. And so early on, I became nervous about the insular world in which appellate justices live in because, in effect, you're grading your own papers. Uh, there's a test out there and you're grading it yourself and nobody ever criticizes you. Not like the Supreme Court uh, uh, where there are commentators and dialogue. Uh, it's almost an invisible environment. And research lawyers for other l judges aren't going to come up to you and say you're out to lunch. Uh, your colleagues, by and large, for a whole series of reasons, are respectful. Uh, the law reviews don't take up your cases. And so what you need, it occurred to me, is to be cautious about being sucked in to an environment which uh, may be comfortable but is not a real world. So you needed courage, you needed a courageous staff, you needed independence, and I was saddened by the fact that nobody schmoozed about that, didn't talk about it, may have been the personalities, other courts may be different, uh, but I learned a great deal from it about the importance of relying on intu intuition, and I guess the theme of many of my comments is I have very good intuition, and I rely upon your instincts, and you have to be courageous, you have to do the right thing. And I guess Nobody got emotional, but it's a tough job. I, I couldn't agree with you more.
and I'm surprised. I thought I did get emotional, but it's such a privilege. Uh, it really is. I feel the same way. I really do. Oh, um, you know, can we talk just for a few minutes about what about your approach to um, deciding a case? Uh, that's that's but, interesting, but that, I think. But for that lapse, and it's interesting, I didn't anticipate it. Uh, but again, it's really a great opportunity. In terms of deciding cases, uh, I, again, I thought it was a hard job. And, and after I decided it was a hard job, I asked myself, uh, how do I want to do it? Because uh, you're only on the bench, uh, you know, one day a month, and it's very easy to be gracious uh, for a day. Uh, with people arguing for 30 minutes. You know, if you're well-dressed and, uh, and smile occasionally, uh, people don't know uh, what's up there, if anything. And you're wearing a black robe, and culturally, people are wonderfully respectful. Whether you're entitled to it or not is a separate question. Uh, but I felt that when I went to cocktail parties and saw lawyers, I'd want to be able to talk about the cases and know them. They were my cases in, in that sense. Uh, and so early on, you know, I'd look at the briefs, and uh, I never had problems making a decision, uh, and uh, never had problems changing my mind. Uh, so that uh, I, uh, Buzz and I, and they, then later uh, Bill, and then we had a second research lawyer, you know, would go through the cases, and I'd say, look, I'm, you know, uh, we'd look at the briefs together or separately. I think we should do so and so in this case. Uh, let me know what your thinking is. And so by the nature of the job and my skills, because in the process I wanted to teach myself to write, and I took that aspect of the job very seriously. So I'm on a learning curve learning how to write, and on a learning curve how to manage efficiency because we have to get cases out, and I did not want to resubmit cases. At the trial court level, I never resubmit a case. As a, tri as a lawyer in the private sector, I realized that what a judge does is decide, and that's important. You can't, that's your job, and you have to do it the best you can. No one bargained for perfection, you do the best you can. And so uh, what one does is, is uh, I'd want the cases uh, to get out. So with uh, Bill Dato, who came on after the first, uh, after Buzz left for a year, and then, uh, 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 Rich Fidel came on, and then uh, uh, Bill came back. Bill would get the tougher cases because by then they were being graded. Uh, again, the, interesting, essentially the same number of cases. So I would give him the big cases. It could take a month or two or three on cases. They just couldn't be done in a week or two. Uh, People versus Hitchcock, uh, other cases uh, take a long time on. And I'd divide up the other cases between uh, the research lawyer and I. So I'd be writing two or three cases, the research lawyer would be writing two or three, and Bill would have the heavy one. And then would be mucking around with the dissents or concurrences, and I'd ask one or the other to, to brainstorm those. So it's an ongoing assembly line. And so I remember my, one of my first cases, it was a uh, a, a true finding, someone had pled, uh, admitted a true allegation, juvenile case, I said, no, I'm sorry, it was an uh, uh, enhancement. I said, well, they, they admitted it. I said, it doesn't seem like a big deal to me, you know, we have to affirm. And then the research lawyer said, well, you have to read People versus Bunnell and certain other cases talking about waiver, on the record, etc. So I'd have no problem deciding, uh, both on the base of intuition, instinct experience, and then one would have to confront the cases and where the cases took us. So it was an ongoing process. Nothing was ever in cement. Uh, you know, if you'd hear oral argument, I think the case should be changed. So, so uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I, I feel, you know, uh, so I'd, we'd decide, and uh, it was, again, an ongoing process until I signed the opinion. It was never a done deal. It was just uh, I could change. Uh, and and with your colleagues, was there agreement reached pretty easily in in most cases? Yeah, I, I had some ground rules. I mean, the colleagues were different. Justice Brown, as I've intimated, uh, you know, was here for twenty plus years. The best of my knowledge, he did not write a dissent in those years. Uh, Justice Staniforth marched to a, a drummer 
uh, in which uh, he had strong views in cases, in criminal cases, in which there was violence. Uh, he was much more liberal in cases in which uh, uh, there was no violence. Uh, he was very sensitive to uh, claims of plaintiffs in personal injury case, cases. Uh, uh, probably not a bundle of tact in some of those statements. Uh, but, uh, you know, the colleagues, uh, you know, we, we didn't have challenges in reaching decisions. There was a, always a cordial process. Uh, I never lobbied one judge without another judge being present. I thought that was inappropriate. And since my oral communication sometimes can't be as clear as thinking things through, reading the cases, brainstorming it with uh, one or more research lawyers, thinking about it, I generally write memos and share them with the other justices on the panel, express my concerns, and uh, or even before oral argument, I would alert somebody, uh, others, I said, I'm concerned about this case. But uh, it was never, it was never a uh, uncomfortable process. Uh, I think I would describe the process. I'd use the word uh, by and large with most of the colleagues here, as cordial, comparing it with collegial. Uh, cordial is quote pleasant close quote. Collegial contemplates uh, intellectual dialogue, uh, meaningful discussion. Uh, it was less than that you than you it would was, have liked. It, it was more. It was a more with certain colleagues more on the cordial side than collegial side, uh, and I was disappointed in that. But that's the way the decisional process uh, works. Some people are not comfortable coming to grips, uh, talking objectively about issues. Uh, the differences amongst justices is not uh, Democratic Republican. In my mind, the differences between justices frequently, I'm overstating this, is between background. Uh, justices, uh, again, overstating it, justices who come from the public sector sometimes see issues differently than those who come from the private sector because of their life's experiences. Uh, for example, Justice Froelich, appointed by a different governor, a very conservative justice, uh, uh, he and I would have commonality because we both came from the private sector. We knew the importance of getting out a case quickly because of the financial aspects of it. Uh, we thought if we could resolve it at the Court of Appeal without a retrial, let's do it rather than sending it back uh, because we were sensitive to the costs associated with it and we were comfortable with our skills. So even though he might start from one side and end up at the middle, and I from another side end up at the middle, it was based on those common experiences we would hash out differences. So we disagreed uh, relatively uh, infrequently. Uh, uh, justices, I probably disagree with Justice Staniforth, who in one sense I should have been agreeing with more because same governor, a Democrat, etc. But his predetermined views on certain aspects of cases uh, was uncomfortable with me. Uh, uh, so they were certainly cordial, but uh, uh, not collegial in the sense of brainstorming. And you mentioned your one dissent. Um, did you dissent often? Uh, much to the su surprise of many folks, uh, I didn't because they, I think uh, they viewed me as, quote, more liberal than I think I really am. Uh, in the material of the which I again I thank people for a time again here. They have a number of dissents, probably uh, as many as 35 in that material. I thought there were 13 published dissents, i.e., less than one a year for the years I was on the court. And when I parsed the material here, what was interesting to me, more than half of my dissents either resulted in a, a non publication, decertification, or grant a review. So I'm left with very few good dissents uh, and in the cases that I've seen. So I didn't dissent that often because I feel very strongly about dissents. Not an ego trip. Uh, is there a way of working out the problem? Is there another solution to the problem? Uh, I feel very strongly that dissents are, uh, unless you feel very strongly, they shouldn't be there. 
because the party should think there's a unanimous decision by a court. Uh, it's, it ends up splintering. It ends up triggering dialogue. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so I was very cautious in writing dissents and very cautious in writing or published dissents. Uh, I, I happen to feel, uh, you know, when I looked at the material here, you know, I saw a person in history. I didn't realize it's the same person that I'm sitting here now. So I had to go back in history uh, looking at some of those dissents. And, uh, uh, you know, I was emotional a few minutes ago. But when I read them again, uh, some of them, again, uh, I am reconvinced uh, at the correctness of it. And, well, that's nice. And, that's a nice uh, feeling. Uh, you know, I, again, uh, I, I'm going to deviate probably from uh, what's allowed of me, but uh, there are a couple. There's one, there are a couple I ran across that, uh, if I could find, if I were that organized, uh, I, Take that, your time. That, that are so, so correct, <laughs> <laughs> egotistical <laughs> and sad. And again, it's history. Uh, but... Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, a long time ago, uh, there's a case called McLaughlin versus Sikors Sikorsky dealing with a helicopter crash. People in the military are killed. And uh, Justice Cologne, I believe, wrote the opinion. Uh, and the issue is the military, the, the governmental immunity doctrine. And the panel says, yes, it applies. Goes back to trial and applies. I happen to think uh, I disagree with that very strongly then and very strongly now. And, and again, uh, what I said, uh, I just, again, this is immodest, perhaps inappropriate, <laughs> is that uh, I say the majority's rejection of state law and adopting a certain holding which allows the governmental immunity doctrine represents, in my view, a skewed cost-benefit analysis where the costs are borne by the injured claimants and benefits in the form of increased profits accrued to private manufacturers, excluding those times of declared war or states of emergency which inject special considerations, I conclude the interests of both the federal and state governments are served when our military personnel are provided with sound and reliable equipment designed and manufactured without defects. You know. We know the timing of this uh, video. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, at least in my mind, it couldn't be, you know, uh, more apropos. Uh, I also dissented in a case called uh, uh, Decker uh, versus uh, Imperial Beach, and in that case, the issue was gross negligence, and uh, in the uh, majority. Uh, hold, uh, if uh, I can find it again, the majority explain that, uh, uh, that's one I could find, explained, uh, no, there are no factual issues. And uh, without getting overly emotional again, assuming I can find it, I try to explain uh, in that case, where I'm, I'm lost and I'm still on tape here and I'm having a nervous That's breakdown. All right. Don't worry about uh, it. Um, I have more papers here than I should have, which only shows why I don't practice law. <laughs> I could never handle papers. All right. uh, The majority had said it's a, okay, the majority in uh, uh, Decker versus Imperial Beach had explained why uh, there were no factual issues, summary judgment. And uh, uh, I explained on a page, which I won't read entirely, uh, that I didn't think uh, understanding what gross negligence was uh, what requires scholarly insight into an arcane subject. Uh, I thought that uh, we should focus on the uh, human factors of the case. Uh, and I ultimately said, so you picture 
a young man caught in some lobster traps uh, in the ocean. He had gone surfing. He's caught there. And some people are on the beach, and there have been helicopters going above, and there, there's a fire chief on the beach with a bullhorn. Uh, and, the, and they're trying to figure out what to do. People are gathered there, but the fire chief won't send anybody out there for a whole series of respectfully bureaucratic concerns. And the majority explains, why well, there are no factual questions here. It's, uh, there's no, can't be any gross negligence. They've done everything you can do. And so I end up saying here, uh, the summary judgment remedy characterized as a drastic remedy to be used with caution has replaced a trial on the merits. Although the appellate record is purportedly cold, I cannot leave this case without admitting that I will remain haunted by the specter of this young, young man's lengthy, unsuccessful struggle against the power of the sea, fighting to stay afloat, emotionally assisted by what can only be described as a callous call from the beach that, quote, help was on the way. In no way can this case be described to the drowning described in another case where lifeguards came, etc. All those participating in the rescue efforts were certified emergency technicians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the case here should be decided on the evidence presented in trial and not on the documents before us. And again, uh, much to my surprise, going back in history, I felt the same way reading this now as I did then. Uh, it's a sad case. And uh, somebody was deprived of a trial, and I thought that's what courts are about, uh, to make sure that people did have trial on the merits. Did, did you ever have one of your opinions reversed by the Supreme Court? Uh, <laughs> sure, I can't. You know, it's funny, I didn't, I didn't look at, at those issues. <laughs> uh, but uh, sure, I had grants of review in cases that I had pulled over and then decertified. Uh, 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 Did that have any particular impact on you? Oh, of course. Uh, <laughs> impact in a number of ways is, again, in deciding what your job is, you develop some kind of relationship with the Supreme Court. And I was comfortable concluding, and I think uh, my colleagues were, or at least most of them were, is the Supreme Court is assigned a defined task. Uh, uh, I'm assigned a defined task. Uh, I'll do my job, it'll do its job. And so I, I ended up being very comfortable uh, with what it's doing and what I was doing. Uh, I, I think a case, uh, you know, so uh, I remember I wrote an opinion in a case, uh, an employment case, which I worked very hard on, a uh, panel worked very hard on, and the Supreme Court decertified, and uh, Jerry Ullman, uh, wrote it up as one of the ten best decertified opinions in some uh, magazine, uh, and he was right. I guess the case in which I, I uh, was uh, saddened about was uh, uh, George versus Krishna, in which there were a very substantial verdict uh, against the Krishnas uh, in a fascinating case. Mill Silverman, a lawyer here in San Diego, tried it. He had a uh, you know, forty-some-odd million-dollar verdict, including punitive damages, which was reversed. And it went, uh, and so we talked about false imprisonment. We talked about the rights uh, of parents to control the lives of their children. Uh, we talked about false imprisonment. Uh, we talked about uh, brainwashing. I mean, it was a case we worked on for months and months and months. Uh, Judge, uh, now Judge Dato, Bill Dato, worked on it. It was a marvelous case. And it was a case in which uh, we said a lot about a lot of issues. It went from our court to the California Supreme Court that denied review and decertified, went to the California Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court to be held pending uh, some discussions on uh, punitive damages. It was sent back to the California Supreme Court in light of its decision. Uh, it was before Campbell. so. Uh, came back, they sent it back to us, Supreme Court sent it back to us for rewriting. Uh, we rewrote it. Now, if you think, if one thinks about it, it's the only time 
a court will have an opportunity to discuss the earlier decertification in that case. I mean, you don't have that opportunity no. often. And so I added provisions, uh, a section at the end, as to why I thought the Supreme Court had decertified and why I thought it should remain published. And Justices Kramer and Work would not sign off on that opinion because they thought it was Because of that? Uh, the, because of that. They thought it was disrespectful. Uh, I thought it would have added uh, a body to a literature talking about publications. If the Supreme Court granted a review, would they respond to it, etc. So, so that's a, a bit of a digression because, uh, for example, in People versus Hedgecock, uh, we, uh, the court here, confronted 27 issues involving the then mayor in San Diego who had been convicted of, uh, of felonies in a highly publicized case. And the lawyering in that case was uh, very good, both on the uh, public and private sides. Very interesting issues. And there were 27 issues. The Supreme Court granted review in two. And so I was thrilled that the Supreme Court granted review because of issues we couldn't decide. We said so in the opinion. They were governed by precedent. And that's how the system should work, where you have a chance to uh, say things on issues. The Supreme Court agrees with those issues, and then for institutional reasons, takes one or two. So the system works together. Uh, and again, uh, 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 Laura Holgren is a Superior Court judge now. She was an extern for me, a marvelous extern. Uh, and uh, when she, before she became a judge, the last case she argued, was a case dealing with lesser, uh, uh, lesser included, lesser related instructions mm -hmm. for the California Supreme Court. Uh, she explained to me that she had argued my dissent in that case, that the Supreme Court should adopt it, and you know, they didn't adopt my decision, but at least my dissent ultimately uh, became uh, the law in California. So the process works in a way where there's an obligation for a judge at in his or her role to do that job and not worry about other roles. They'll take care of themselves because the system does mesh and work together. Well, you talked about a couple of your um, memorable dissents. Uh, do you have any memorable, other memorable majority opinions? Um, They're all memorable. <laughs> yeah. uh, Anything that had a, a, any particular impact, either locally or statewide, or yeah, we, on the development of the law? Uh, Hurtado versus statewide home loan was a case that had a lot of uh, publicity. I think it's an important case. That was a case in which we spent a lot of time talking about discretion. What do we mean by judicial discretion? It's a phrase that's bandied about. Nobody ever really thinks about it. So that triggered a lot of dialogue and uh, triggered a lot of energy. Uh, when I look back at what I did and how I see the job is there's a sorting out process that's ongoing. And what justices, I think, have to be concerned with is they become uh, a, a person on an assembly line uh, that sort of a, a boilerplate kind of uh, a world rather than, you know, what's really going on here. And so, uh, you know, I'd heard discretion bandied about so much. What do they really mean? So Hurtado, I think, versus statewide home loan was important. Uh, People versus Patrick, in which we talked about uh, could somebody uh, uh, commit a crime uh, when they were asked to go rescue somebody from a cult and brainwashing. Uh, the S Del Mar versus the city of San Diego and the whole development of North City West uh, was, a, a, I thought, a very important uh, a case. Uh, the Civil Service Commission case dealing with conflicts of lawyers and who does the county represent uh, cases. Uh, People versus Hyde was a case in San Diego in which they never found uh, the body of the person who was uh, 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 murdered, and it was a first-degree murder conviction. Uh, the uh, case involving uh, the uh, recusal of a uh, judge in uh, uh, Imperial County uh, dealing with the judicial recusal and what did they mean by 
and how do you go how do you go about with that that challenge of recute disqualification of a judge uh, you know are there others but there are there are a handful uh, I mentioned Patrick I mentioned Hyde mm -hmm. uh, Hedgecock uh, unquestionably Krishna unquestionably oh a and m a and m versus f m c there was a first decision on uh the unconscionability of provisions of the uh, certain provisions of the uniform commercial code mm -hmm. so we laid the groundwork for procedural unconscionability and substantive unconscionability uh uh, which which uh, ended up, I think, uh, being very significant in later literature. Literature, it spawned a, a ton of articles uh, on unconscionability. But again, in terms of process, although the question isn't asked, I had a chap as an extern from UCLA, an absolutely marvelous uh, chap, Steve Morgan, who happened to be an Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, uh, man from uh, who had a brilliant sense of humor. <laughs> And he had a simple case uh, dealing with a, a machine that didn't work very well, uh, grading tomatoes out of imperial, and you know were they entitled? Uh, there were certain pleading questions, et cetera, and so it came to us. And he delved into it. He spent an entire semester, as if it was some marvelous Talmudic challenge, and uh, <laughs> he came to us. Uh, I say us, uh, this, uh, me. Well, I got to leave, Judge, and he wheeled in the stuff, you know, uh, uh, several feet high, and uh, uh, Bill Dato and I went through it, and we said, you know, do we want to finish this, or should we forget about it? Because courts of appeal don't have the time to write a, an opinion like that, but we didn't want to disappoint Steve, and so we worked on it and uh, generated this opinion, which became a very big deal. Uh, and justifiably, it's a very important case, and it was uh, very interesting. Uh, that is interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about judicial philosophy, um, and the, really the first question I have is, would you say that you had a philosophy that guided your ju judicial decision making? Uh, the answer is, uh, I th you know, if, if by philosophy, you know, was there a way I went about the job, the answer is yes. If it was, you know, liberal, conservative, you know, uh, right or left, I think the answer is clearly no. I think I was uh, very unpredictable. I mean, again, a case, Opsal versus USAA, is a case in which uh, we reversed uh, a, uh, uh, you know, a bad faith judgment, saying there was no bad faith as a matter of law, because what the insurance company uh, did was reasonable. You know, uh, I also authored Delos versus uh, Farmers, which is uh, immodestly, I think, a landmark insurance bad faith case. Uh, I, I think, I think, uh, I did have a philosophy. I had to under, I had to understand the issues. Uh, I had to sort out the issues. I had to figure out who we were writing for. Uh, we were writing for the lawyers in a given case. Uh, we're writing for the parties in a given case. We're writing for the Supreme Court. Is it the family law bar? Is it the trial judge? Uh, and then it had to be said in a way that I could understand it, anybody else could understand it. And it had to be said in a way that wasn't overarching or overreaching because I wasn't smart enough to anticipate all the things that could happen. So I wanted it to be as narrow as possible and I also wanted it uh, to be consistent with California law because I knew my job was to decide it consistent with law if that uh, were possible. So uh, I was concerned with just doing the job in an environment in which it's very easy to, quote, cheat, close quote, because people don't know if you're doing the job. I think frequently in life, the perks are a lot greater and more pleasurable than the job itself. The court of appeal, the judging job at every level is very hard, and I think the special person, I, I, I think it's a lot harder than people think, and so consequently, I just try to do the job. 
Um, you, you mentioned being, uh, you didn't use the word, but you know, constrained, say, by Supreme Court precedent. Um, I, I did want to ask um, about resolving conflicts between, we might say, law and conscience. Um, what's come up, you know, personally for me sometimes is that I, I might have decided a case differently, but uh, either there's precedent where that says uh, I have to go a certain way, or more commonly, the standard of review is abuse of discretion. Um, and so, while I would, I might not have done what the trial court did. Um, you know, was there was what they did really an abuse of discretion? Was that an issue for you at all? No, I just uh, no, I never had that problem. Uh, the only time conscience was a factor is I never wanted a research lawyer to write an opinion, even as a first draft, in which he or she disagreed. And so the rules were uh, with me is. If you didn't agree, you didn't have to do it. Or uh, if you didn't agree, write it your way. I'd write it my way. I'd circulate both. Uh, really? I, I didn't want anybody to do anything in my environment in which was contrary to intellectual conscience. But would you have discussions where you tried to persuade them to see it your way? Yeah, or I mean, I can think of only a, I have memory. I have really no memory of ever having a meaningful disagreement. You know, I don't know it was a courtesy or, or deference or seniority or belief. I think I'd like to think it's the latter. But we didn't disagree. And uh, uh, I, remember, I remember one case with uh, Bill Dato dealing with criminalizing, closing the doors in peep shows. He thought it was uh, 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 criminalizing it was uh, unconstitutional. I didn't. So we circulated his, uh, we sat on it to the judge. You know, I'm sharing this with you. Bill thinks it should go this way. I think it should go this way. Sign whatever draft you're comfortable with. Hmm. And uh, if somebody disagrees with me, uh, I'd like to see their draft. Uh, so that's what we did. He didn't get any votes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to turn to um, the judiciary today, um, some things that are going on. Um, you hear. Uh, we hear a lot of uh, references in um, media to judicial activism. Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I think it's an overused word. I think it's done on the political side. I think if there's any activism, and it's uh, arguably at the high court level, U.S. Supreme Court, California Supreme Court, I don't see it at the uh, trial courts, at the intermediate courts appeal. Frankly, less so. Uh, the judges are very sensitive to c political and social constraints now, more so than they were 20 years ago. Um, do you, can you think of, uh, or you, have you thought at all about any major challenges that you think might be facing the judicial system today? I, I do. I, I think there are a number of challenges. Uh, you know, I've been in the private sector since January 1, 1994, uh, doing a, a, a private dispute resolution. And uh, I've now seen uh, over 2,200 cases. Uh, and I think a significant challenge for the courts is uh, how and or in what way uh, courts on the civil side uh, should confront and or address a perceived market for the private uh, uh, judicial system. And I think that uh, uh, states are confronting it differently. In the state of uh, Florida, for example, uh, court-approved private dispute resolution is, a, is essentially mandated with a certification process, et cetera. In California, uh, the Chief Justice, uh, and again, I indicated earlier my uh, compliments for this project and on a personal level a high degree of affection and respect for him, I uh, disagree uh, strongly with uh, his view that the private dispute resolution and the public uh, justice system should be kept uh, totally separate uh, with a bright line, which notwithstanding the statute and, and, uh, and uh, frankly, the Constitution, which would allow me and others to sit, there's a bright line that prevents me from sitting on assignment because somehow the public system gets tainted uh, and or, uh, or potentially tainted 
and I'm told, I don't know if this is accurate or not, if I'm in the private sector for two years, I'm irrevocably tainted. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, uh, the Chief Justice and the Judicial Council, uh, in his role as, as Chair of the Judicial Council, and as the Administrator of the Courts throughout California, uh, he essentially has barred all persons who are interested in the public sector from being involved in the public sector, essentially stripping away uh, our role as a judge. So he has defranchised us. And I think that has an enormous uh, psychic effect. I think it deprives the public system of learning a great deal because in my world, the private sector should be diminished and shrunk considerably. Uh, there's no reason that cases shouldn't go into the public sector. Uh, but why do they go to the private sector? I think that should be studied. Well, I was just going to ask you why you think there's such a demand for alternative dispute because resolution. Because it's perceived as if the private sector can do a better job. It's perceived as if they're more willing to take the time and energy and effort. And I think all of these skills are available in the public sector. But for reasons that are not clear to me, that effort has not been made. To the best of my knowledge, there's never been a study made uh, in which entities such as private companies, insurance companies, uh, 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 people in industry, why, I mean, they haven't been asked why do they go to the private sector rather than the public sector, and they haven't. Uh, and I think this information will be very valuable, and I think the courts should have doors open for uh, resolution for people who have disputes so we don't end up with what is coming to be a dual system of justice where the rewards of the private side are greater than the rewards of the public side and the impact may be more significant. So I think it's a real issue that is being held in abeyance by this bright line, which I think is a tragedy uh, and uh, uh, it, for a whole series of reasons. Uh, and other aspects facing the courts is, I think, uh, diminished respect. Uh, getting involved in areas in which they may not have the ability to handle, getting involved in social issues. I mean, for example, we have drug courts now. Are the courts the best place to handle it? I don't know the answers to that, but I th see cases coming out of the courts, civil cases, into the private side, and social issues going into the courts. I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm changing topic a little bit, getting back to your experiences on the court. How did the court change uh, during your tenure here? You, there were, you said, three other judges when you started. Well, it went. Okay. Stand by. All right. If you okay. want to ask a question again. Oh, I was asking uh, how, the, how the composition of the court changed. Well, we went from four justices to ultimately eight justices. We went from the state building to this building, Symphony Towers. Uh, we went from Justice Brown and the way he had done things to Justice Kramer, the way uh, he then did things. So we increased in size, a little more uh, organized, slant bureaucratic. Uh, computers came in, uh, went from one research lawyer to two research lawyers. Now, the history of that, again, is interesting. Uh, when Chief Justice Byrd uh, early on was concerned with the fact cases were staff driven, so she, quote, wanted elbow clerks. Uh, to help so that they would now become a judge-driven opinion with an elbow clerk limited to one year. Well, that morphed itself into two permanent research lawyers. So instead of, a, if it was staff-driven before, and I'm not saying it was, or if it's good or bad, and I'll put that aside, it's now clearly, it's that it becomes more administrative because you have two research lawyers. And so that's changed the job because, and with computers, it's changed the job because it becomes a, a greater administrative burden in reviewing cases from two research lawyers, uh, along with uh, more frequency of writs. I mean, writs are routine. Uh, uh, everything becomes uh, uh, bulkier because of word processes. You know, when we first were there, you know, I had carbon paper uh, not that long ago. Uh, but, but again, in terms of, of change, it's so interesting. Uh, I remember calling Ralph Gampel when we we're going to have computers. Ralph Gampel was the administrative director of the courts under Rose Bird. And I had happened to have a client in the computer world, a guy named Dick Pick. And he started, he had the first meaningful operating system, Pick operating system, still exists, before Microsoft. And uh, I called Ralph and I said, you know, I know somebody who's capable in uh, software. 
and you're buying, going to buy computers for the appellate courts in California. He said, we don't need that, Howard. Thanks very much. We're going to go out and buy Wang computers. Okay. Uh, Wang computers came. We all had computers here. And I remember a memo going out from some, from Ralph, I guess that it came from, asking, could any secretary assist with the word processing system that we had with Wang? Because it couldn't do footnotes. Uh, and, you know, again, the notion that in this bureaucratic world, you write out a check for everybody gets a computer, and, and they ask for a secretary, have me a secretary at this court that came up with help for the software, so it would do to write uh, notes, uh, footnotes. You know, I started to develop an anxiety for thoughtfulness in the bureaucratic world, and uh, it wasn't long after they threw away all the wangs, and we ended up with, uh, you know, different computers, et cetera. Uh, and, and so, so the, the, uh, the world changed. You know, we ended up with a computer operator, we ended up with assistant computer operator, we, and, and so uh, I became concerned that people would get so focused on screens, they would stop reading books and stop thinking. But uh, well, there are changes. Did you want to uh, comment at all about the um, PJ and APJ system? I, to this extent, uh, I would opt for a system in which the legislation would be changed instead of having a seat in which someone becomes the uh, presiding justice upon appointment. I, I think that person should become a, a, an associate justice, and I think the persons there should then have the opportunity to vote in some kind of term uh, because it, it's conceptually possible for the person to be appointed to a presiding justice seat to be a wonderfully skilled justice, but just not either have the interests or skills to be a presiding justice. I think the administrator presiding justice format's fine, but uh, I, I, Term limits. I, I, I would think that, uh, I would prefer an election by colleagues, and maybe a term and a turnover in some way. Let's see. Um, uh, one of the um, topics that's suggested is historical perspectives. Um, and uh, one thing I did want to ask you about is whether you have perceived changes in society's attitude toward the law over the years. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's far less respectful. I think it's, uh, uh, it's become cynical. Uh, they view uh, law and judges as, you know, part of the political process. I think there's uh, less respect for for government now, for a whole series of reasons, and I think uh, uh, judges are in that uh, a setting. Uh, and and what guidance do, do they get? Uh, you know, they watch television so they can see Judge Judy. We recently had the case uh, uh, Ann Nicole Smith. Uh, you know, where's her body going to be buried? So we had some chap in Florida uh, who gives incompetence new meaning, and uh, you know, uh, that's the uh, public image. So. Uh, and, and I think uh, I, I think uh, there may be less stars out there at the trial and appellate courts because I think it's tougher and tougher to be a great judge, and I think the qualities of independence and uh, courage uh, I think become subordinated to anxieties over acceptance. And I think the private dispute arena has impacted the quality of the judiciary in that I think judges are frightened now to be as outspoken because they don't want to impact their career uh, after becoming a judge. One of the great things about being a lawyer is that judicial outrage was so healthy uh, because people could be criticized properly in settings. That's disappearing because people don't want to damage their image when they go into private sector. Uh, it's becoming a, uh, you want to have a brand and your brand wants to be a silicon, uh, sugar-coated, slick brand where you're acceptable to everybody so you can get big fees in cases. Do you think that's true of, 
of appellate judges and trial judges? Uh, in my mind, I'd, I'd quickly say trial judges from my outgoing. Know, I, again, I don't mean to, I mean, I have a high regard for the trial bench, and I overstate it uh, to make a point, perhaps. I think less so at the appellate court, but, but the rewards of being independent and courageous are, are I mean, who, who, who gives the uh, courageous, independent judge a hug? Colleagues aren't because you've made them irritated. You're not going along. The parties who prevail think it's great. Parties who lose don't like you. The bar doesn't function in a way in which there are appropriate kudos because of fear of, of getting too close to the bench. The legal journals, you know, aren't writing about you. Uh, it's just that private satisfaction of doing the right job exactly. and that kind of reward is tough. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, you need an environment and what's, what certain courts have an environment in which that's possible and other courts uh, don't have it. Uh, um, I want to um, ask you, uh, you know, some questions, and you've touched on this, of course, during our conversation already. But uh, some of the th what it has meant to you, I should say, on a personal level, to be a judge in terms of, you know, the the rewards uh, uh, from your career as a judge. <laughs> well, I, I think today, much to my surprise, again, I have been surprised at uh, how emotional I've been, uh, and I can get because I'm not an emotional guy. And uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, you know, certain things grab me. Just the privilege of having a job, I just can't. Thank everybody enough uh, for that. It really was a privilege. And although parts of it were uncomfortable uh, because uh, uh, starting out was a tough job and because uh, later on uh, people uh, saw it differently than I did, uh, uh, by differently uh, they saw it as an assigned task and essentially a governmental employee. And I uh, didn't think that's the case. I don't think it's the case. It really is a temple of justice where you're allowed to do great things. Uh, and so it was a great thrill to be here, here in this building, and to be at Appellate Justice. And there are a lot of other justices who felt the same way, colleagues on this court uh, who felt the same way, and so, and others, uh, Supreme Court justices and others, and as well as lawyers. So my personal satisfaction, I can't say enough about. Uh, so while it was hard, you, you uh, loved it. Yeah, it really was a, a great job. Uh, it was a good time for me to leave. It was a time for me to do something else. Uh, certain repetition of the cases. Uh, I'm not confrontational. And I think the system, by the way, uh, if I could impose upon the Chief Justice, I think the system should allow rewards for seniority. There are some economic rewards now, but appointments to, to committees or to commissions, et cetera, should consider that as a factor rather than solely a personality or friendship, et cetera. Uh, but uh, it meant a great deal, and uh, it was a great job and a uh, great time in my life. Uh, uh, so I've even forgotten the question. Did now. it? Did, did I'm going to oh. it because it's all right, and anytime you're ready. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to ask next was whether uh, your being a judge um, had any particular impact on your family life and or social activities. Yeah, I think it limits uh, social activities. Uh, you know, again, it's role playing in life. You know, you, you don't go to a bar and drink too much. Uh, uh, you know, when you're in public gatherings, you like to think you're dressed appropriately. It changes. Uh, you know, if you're going to, uh, you know, hang out someplace and relax, you're going to do it at home or uh, in another environment, another city, etc. You know, it's role playing. Uh, you're constrained in communication, uh, and, and socially, you're constrained. It, it limits, uh, I think, uh, your outlets or the canon of judicial ethics uh, uh, interfere with things you can't say and do. But uh, I didn't find them limited. It didn't bother me. It uh, didn't, didn't impact our lives considerably. Um, do you uh, have any advice that you would give to new judges? <laughs> I think the person who gets uh, appointed should be comfortable in his or her own skin. So before you get appointed, you know, figure out who you are. It may be uh, the job looks good, but you're not going to like it. You're not going to be very good at it. Uh, assuming you're comfortable with uh, 
uh, uh, the job, just do the job. Don't, don't, uh, don't get overly cerebral and figure out the brand of judge you want to be and then earmark yourself for that person. Uh, you just do the job, uh, see the issues and decide them and uh, simply work hard and don't be embarrassed to say you don't understand and try to mask it so that uh, uh, you're not doing the job and uh, you know bite your tongue, be pleasant, pleasant, pleasant and when you find you can't be pleasant uh, confront it with a pal or a clerk or the lawyer or the party and simply say I'm uncomfortable uh, uh, with certain things you're doing either one of us has to straighten up uh, here so keep your cool take a lot of recesses uh, the first 30 days on the job are going to establish your reputation so whatever you do you know do a great job on the first 30 days because that's who you're going to be and don't be afraid to quit if you don't like the job uh, uh, so, so have a sense of humor, be compassionate, uh, all, it's all just do the job. Such good advice. Uh, yeah. Such good advice. Um, looking back on, uh, we've touched on this also, but looking back on your judicial career, um, are there any, um, other than your cases, any other achievements that you're, that you're most proud of? Well, I did, you know, because of this questionnaire and the work people did, I obviously reflected on it, otherwise I wouldn't have talked so much, uh, <laughs> wouldn't have remembered so much. But uh, I did uh, contact a couple of colleagues, and I said, you know, well, tell me who I am. <laughs> uh, and uh, the responses that came back, uh, obviously they're favorable. I, as I said, uh, I was a very careful uh, legal craftsman, uh, the best that they had encountered. Uh, I always cared about the little guy. Uh, I was a wonderful mentor. I really was respectful and went on out of my way for new judges. And on occasion, I could be very funny. Uh, and you know, uh, I'm very happy with that. Yeah, you sh yeah well, you should be. Um, you, I don't know if you want to discuss this, but you alluded to it a minute ago. Did you want to discuss it all your, the reasons you left the bench? Yeah, time ago. Okay. <laughs> it was time ago. I, I thought it was time ago, uh, and and uh, uh, there was a there was a delay in processing cases here that uh, I was becoming increasingly comfortable with, but it was simply time ago. Uh, I didn't realize all the factors that were at play. Uh, one of the factors at play, interestingly, uh, I had to give a talk. I gave a talk to a, a criminal uh, a prosecution law enforcement group in San Diego. Very large diversified group and they asked me to that question and I had not thought about it but a factor was uh, I was uncomfortable dealing with the violence uh, and the tension between doing a great job as a judge and the terrible people who do terrible things uh, you know when you have a case as I had where a couple of guys uh, say let's go out and behead somebody tonight and you see an appeal in a first-degree murder case in which the prosecution of that county, not San Diego County, thought it had to do nothing other than to set out the facts regardless of what the law might be, all kinds of potential error. So the tension between doing a great job as a judge and the constitutional rights that a defendant, even defendants who've done bad things are entitled to, and the violence became stressful. Hmm. I didn't appreciate the violence we see in the cases, the impact on the trial and appellate courts. It takes a toll on you. And uh, I didn't want to see that violence anymore. I wanted to hide. Uh, so I don't read the criminal case anymore. Civil case, yes. The violence is a factor. Time to go. Both in the interview and <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> I was going to say, is there anything else that you, that you want to say? I think I've covered everything I wanted to ask you. Uh, I'm sure when I look at this, I'll uh, uh, make sure to thank the videographer. Uh, can't thank you enough. I mean, God, you're awesome. Uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed about the emotion. No. Uh, I just hope people who look at it realize 
Uh, it's a great job, and I think I uh, hope people care about the justice system. Thank you so much. Okay. This was wonderful. Ah, oh, <laughs>